Hello everybody, it's Michael Hollands once again for Sound of the Movies. Today I have the pleasure to be joined by the great Joseph Trapanese. On this episode, we will discuss some of his career highlights, as well as the brand new Netflix series Shadow and Bone, which is based on the Grisha novel trilogy by Lee Bardugo. It is my pleasure to welcome Joseph Trapanese. Great to be here, Michael. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. It's great to have you on my show. And thank you very much, Joe, for taking the time out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate that. And before we talk about um, Shadow and Bone, I would like to briefly discuss also your work on Tron Legacy, directed by Joseph Kaczynski. Because as I understand, in 2010, you had been hired as an orchestrator for this particular project, the highly anticipated sequel to Tron, which was released in 1982. Um, could you please tell me how you got involved at this early stage in your career, Joe? Yeah, sure. It's, it's actually a very complicated story. You know, it was, it was the end of 2008 that I got a call um, from the music supervisor, Jason Bentley, um, to come meet Daft Punk. And it was thanks to my mentor at the time, Christoph Beck. And uh, so Chris and I, you know, he had asked me to just do some extra help around the studio because he was so busy. And I, I was really young. I was in my early 20s, just interning, assisting, just helping composers. And so for a summer, I just worked in Chris's studio, building some computers, doing technical things, but he, he knew that I had a musical background. I went to Manhattan School of Music to study classical orchestration and theory and harmony. And he also, he got super busy that summer and asked me to take a stab at arranging a cue. He had, he had done a whole piano mock-up. It, it was in no way, I wasn't writing anything. I was just fleshing out a cue for him. And so, you know, he invited me to do that. He saw that I, you know, was, uh, I guess, talented enough. <laughs> and so later that year, um, when Daft Punk came to visit Los Angeles, they wanted to meet with Chris because they knew his brother, uh, Chili Gonzalez, who's a really great, uh, he actually, I think he lived in Cologne for a long time. And, and I think, or, and now he might be in Cologne, but he's lived all over. He lived in Paris, lived in Berlin. Um, he's a great artist, performing artist who does, who writes and performs classical piano and raps. I mean, he's he's just kind of a musical genius. And I've, I've been, I had the pleasure of seeing him perform before. He's incredible. But anyway, Chili knows Daft Punk and said, oh, you should meet my brother, Chris. So they met Chris. Um, Chris, listen to what they had to say, what they were trying to do. You know, at that point, Daft Punk hadn't really done anything yet for the film. They were just like, hey, we're thinking of scoring this film. How do we score a film? How does it work? Can you please talk to us about this? And they also met with, on Zimmer and John Powell and Harry Gregson Williams. And I think Disney was probably planning on pairing them up with Hans Zimmer. You know, I, I, I think I could only speculate. I, I don't know for sure, but I assume, and, and from what I understand, you know, they were trying to pair Daft Punk up with one of those composers so that Disney would know they would have a movie delivered. You know, when you hire Hans Zimmer or Harry Gregson Williams or Chris Beck or any of these guys, you know, you're going to get a movie delivered. But when you hire, an artist, you, you know, you, you might not be sure that, oh, are we really going to get a properly delivered film score? So in their meeting, Chris realized Daft Punk had no interest in being paired with one of these guys, that Daft Punk wanted to do the film on their own, uh, but they still needed help. You know, Chris was saying, OK, you guys need someone who's classically trained, who understands film score. He said, oh, you should hire Joe. <laughs> and so somehow me you know at the age of 24 I, I meet that punk and they decide to hire me and at the beginning I was very much just exactly that I was a composer assistant but the magic of this scenario was that that punk not only was creating some incredible music and inc incredible ideas but they you know they wanted uh they wanted someone to work with who was young uh, classically trained, but also knew about film scoring, but also loved electronic music. I had played with synthesizers since I was 13 years old. So I think there was just a bit of magical timing there where, you know, they were looking for someone like me. I happen to have a skill set <clears throat> that they wanted. And then towards the end of the process, I said, you know, I'd love to orchestrate this movie. 
And they said, well, you know, that sounds great, but you know, you've never orchestrated a movie this big. Don't you think you, you'd, uh, it would be helpful if we hired like a, a you know, well-known orchestrator to help you. And I said, Oh, you know, I actually know one, uh, you know, my mentor, Bruce Broughton. And that's how Bruce came to be involved in the project was, you know, Bruce, I'd been studying with on and off for many years um, from my time at UCLA. So that's where I met Bruce um, and the Mancini Institute. So I, I had known Bruce for a while. And so he came on board to just look at my scores and give me feedback. And Bruce, Bruce came up with some incredible stuff that's in the movie that I loved that, you know, he helped me kind of rethink how I was working with the brats in a few scenes. But uh, anyway, I hope I haven't taken up too much time on your podcast now explaining this situation, but it's, it's such an interesting story that it's not like, uh, you know, I magically dropped out of the sky and orchestrated <laughs> Tron legacy. It was, it was several years of, of collaboration and, and really, I have to say the key was the key to all of it was Daft Punk's understanding that in order to deliver a film or in order to write a film score, they had to become film composers. The, they very much took two years out of their schedule, stopped what they were doing, built a studio, um, put a team together. So the core team was them, me and Dan Lerner. And Dan is a, an incredible uh, engineer and uh, uh, and music technician, and so he, he built he he built the studio. I helped build the orchestral template alongside of him. Um, you know, Dan spent many years working with John Powell, and to this day, still works in in, in film music as an engineer and uh, is a great guy. He's he wired up the studio I'm sitting in right now. So yeah, a lot of <laughs> you brought a lot of memories back. <laughs> ah, great! And uh, needless to say, you're not taking up too much of of, of my time because I, I I enjoy these stories, and I think we could probably talk about this forever. And uh, we could, so, <laughs> yes. And uh, but Joe, did you actually also have a hand in the um, sound design and the actual scoring to picture to some degree? That that's exactly what it was. It was, you know, from day one, um, you know, basically in January of 2009, uh, Daft Punk moved to L.A., you know, and I built a studio with them, with Dan. You know, we the four of us worked together for a couple months building this studio. Daft Punk had already um, on just on laptops started some ideas and logic and Ableton. And like, for instance, like I'll never forget, you know, them playing the clue theme for the first time you know, it was such a vivid experience. And I immediately said, Oh, I want to have some ideas for orchestral uh, textures that we could add here, you know, so, you know, the next day, I, I, I helped add the orchestration to it. And we sent it to Joe Kaczynski, and he loved it. So, you know, sometimes there's just magic like that, where it just comes together. But you're exactly right in that it was a true collaboration where, you know, for instance, we had the Disney logo at the beginning that everyone knew we wanted to like digitize it. So to like have some Disney magic, but have it digitized. So Daft Punk had introduced me to these really interesting spectral and granular plugins. And I said, okay, let's spend an afternoon messing with this. So I'd come up with this like idea on the Celesta that was just like a little scale that we then processed into these interesting granulated uh, spectral plugins that then became the opening. And so, yes, I was very much involved in the sound design and the programming it was very much a team effort. And, and so I, I still look back on that and it informs so much of what I do today in the sense of, um, in the sense of collaboration that there is no, you know, yes, of course, I guess we could build these boundaries where I do this and you do that and the engineer does this, but at the same time, there's so many great opportunities for creative overlap where, you know, as, as someone who has a background in orchestration as well as electronics, and electronic music that I could serve as a bridge, not only working with the orchestra, but also working with integrating the electronics into the orchestra. So it, it was very much a two year collaborative effort that there, you know, the boundaries were really a blur. There was, there was no boundary uh, during that time. Okay, great. And uh, the work on Tron certainly paid off as you subsequently also were asked to score the uh, TV series Tron Uprising, which encompassed 19 episodes. So that, that was another challenge in itself, I reckon. It was, and it was a great challenge because, you know, I, I think uh, at the heart of it, I, I'm, I love making film music. I love, you know, something cinematic. You know, I think that's what's so special about uh, Tron Uprising as well as Shadow and Bone, which is 
you know, you it's quote unquote TV, but it's it's striving to be very cinematic. And so with Tron Uprising, the exciting thing about T and I guess this is the exciting thing about TV in general, rather than just having an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours to explore musical material. Like you said, 19 episodes, 19 half hour long episodes. What's that? You know, you know, I think we probably at the, at the end of the day, because there was also the the little micro series that we did, you, you know, it was probably eight to 10 hours of music that is variations on uh, the Tron legacy uh, aesthetic, you know, that 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 Daft Punk and I built. So I think I think that's what was so exciting about it is that we put so much time and energy these two years into scoring a movie, you know, that. I think we all felt like there was so much more material to explore that we could easily have done two, three more movies. But, you know, what was cool is we got a TV series. So, you know, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much for elaborating on that, Joe. And before, we, before we dive into Shadow and Bone, there is just a couple of things I would like to breeze over. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite movies of the past couple of years is um, Nightcrawler. And you had a score producer credit on this one. And, and the score was written by James Newton Howard and directed by Dan Gilroy. Um, how did you incorporate your knowledge and expertise into this collaboration with James Newton Howard? That was such a fun time. You know, James couldn't be obviously like more of a hero to me. Like I, 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 I model a lot of things in my career after, after James, just because he is someone who works really hard, someone who constantly delivers great scores for great films. And so I very much, you know, he is very much a hero of mine. And so to get a call from him that said, Hey Joe, you know, will you work with me on this? So basically I can't remember which one came first. You know, we did three, there were three films we had a little bit of collaboration on. It was, um, the first one was the Jason Bourne film he yes, did. Yes. Um, then was Nightcrawler. And then there was uh, one of the Hunger Games films. I I did some additional programming for one of the big finales. And and basically, you know, when James called me on those three films, he, he felt like, kind of like this collaboration with Daft Punk, how that kind of worked. He felt like he had done a lot of great work that he was very happy with and everyone was happy with, but he felt that there were a few things that could be done to enhance them, to bring more interesting material to the table. And so um, it's funny, this is my first time really talking about Nightcrawler, you know, uh, so so I have never really spoken about it. I'm glad you asked because that film, I, I think that film came out great. And basically what my role on that film was, was for several scenes, I essentially was a remix artist, you know, where I would take, his original material, repopulate it, reconstruct it, add new sounds. And, and so it was this interesting kind of, like we were talking about earlier, how the lines can be blurred sometimes. I was working a lot with, um, with the score engineer at the mix, you know? So, so I'm really proud of things like that because, you know, there's so many ways to be creative and to contribute in Hollywood. Um, and while, so while I didn't, write any of nightcrawl i have nothing to do with any of the compositional material that's all james you know there were quite a few scenes where i was able to get really creative about how those materials were put together as well as add new material and just just kind of reimagine things and you know some of it i, I don't think a lot of it like some of it maybe didn't wind up in the movie because it was a little too crazy but i think <laughs> that's what james wanted you know he wanted us to just try something and again, I'll, uh, that's another reason why I respect James so much, because he's not someone tied to tradition. You know, he's not saying, oh, I'm just going to deliver every film the same way. He could very easily say that and just say, hey, I'm just going to deliver. You know, I've done this so many times. I'll just do the same thing again. But no, he's much more interested in being creative. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> I've never been asked about Nightcrawler. I'm so glad you Re did. Really? OK, that 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 surprises me. But I mean, I, um, I watched a movie in, in the theater and I, then I bought the um, the Blu-ray and of course I bought the score. And then, of course, the uh, the credits also say no um, score produced by uh, by Joe Trapanese. And I was like, hmm, I, I could have, you know, th there is some material there or here's a sound there which 
I think Joe could have, uh, or could have, or might have, uh, might have delivered. And I also know um, Sven Falconer, who also um, was. Uh, oh, Sven's great. That's yeah. how I know Sven is from. Oh yeah, Sven is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's one. Of the, I think that's one of the key secrets of of uh, Hollywood is making sure you have great people around you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, yes. Uh, you know, Sven is one of them. Yes, and so I, I just needed to ask you about this one because it's a, it's a r really good movie. And I know we could, you know, talk about, you know, um, Disney's Lady and the Tramp and also The Greatest Showman Forever. But I don't want to uh, get into detail because we have a little time constraint. But I also... Well, we'll do that uh, in the future. Yes, on a future podcast. Yes, I look forward to that. And uh, we also need to talk about um, Oblivion at some point because that, I feel, is one of your one of your um, strongest efforts. And now, Joe, let's dive right into the fantasy world of Shadow and Bone, the eight-part Netflix series. Season one is now available. And uh, Joe, were your uh, first ideas based on the book, actually, or did you watch some footage to get inspired and to map out your first ideas? It was all based on the book and the scripts. You know, I I, I basically went uh, for holiday in at the end of 2020, um, or excuse me, at the end of 2019. My goodness, the years the years <laughs> go by. Um, but you know, I met I met the team uh, right before the holidays in 2019. Was asked to come on board, and that was my homework for for the holidays. Was hey, read these books, read these scripts, get to know get to know uh, the series, get to know these characters. And I'm really passionate about that because especially on a series where you're going to have to generate so much material. And then especially on a, on a book series where there's so many fans who might have expectations. Now, to be clear, I don't, I don't think about fan expectations as I work. I just know that there's a lore and a mythology that people are invested in. And I should invest myself in it as well to make sure that I'm delivering the best possible you know, product. I hate to call my creative art a product, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, sometimes, you know, that is the way you have to think about it. Like, Hey, I'm going to be a part of this thing that so many people, not just Lee, uh, the author and not just Eric, the show owner, but so many millions of fans have invested their lives in, in, uh, it's only right that I do the same, you know? So I really got into the books, got into the scripts, And as they were shooting the, the, the series in early 2020, I was writing themes and writing ideas. And, you know, part of, you know, part of the, the skill set of being a film composer, I think, is the ability. I think it was Bruce Lee, right, who said, you know, be like water. You know, water adapts to anything. When it's in a glass, it takes the shape of a glass, you know. So I think, you know, I'm always ready to throw away my material and start again. So I don't mind starting early. You know, I, I, I don't mind the possibility of being wrong, wrong. And oftentimes you start early and you wind up throwing most of it away because, you know, because you were wrong. You didn't see the final picture at a slightly different tone than you had imagined. Um, and again, that's fine. Sometimes it's about finding, it's about uh, writing an hour of bad music or wrong music till you get to the right music. Sometimes you have to, write the wrong music in order to get to the right music. If, if you, you, you know, like that's certainly yes. something I keep in mind, but, but, you know, the luck would have it that just about all the music that I had written was, you know, I sent it out to the showrunner. He loved it, sent it to the author. She loved it uh, sent it to the other producers. They, they loved it. I think, I think at that point, you know, they had realized that, you know, I was as, as invested as they were. And I think that's sometimes one of the problems we have as composers in Hollywood. We, we book ourselves too busy and we take on too much work and we don't invest enough of ourselves in, into, into something. And this was a case where I was able to really get invested in something and everyone saw that the tremendous amount of thought that I put into every note that I was writing. And so, you know, by the time we got to actually scoring, Of course, there's plenty of times where we had to rewrite or rewrite, revise or do something. But I, I, I have to say just about more than any other series I've worked on, what you hear in the final product is, is very close to what was initially imagined at the very beginning. Okay, great. Thank you, Joe. And you, you just mentioned the uh, fan expectations. Uh, that's very interesting because I think if you take these 
expectations into consideration, you might eventually just, you know, go nuts because, you know, if I write this cue, will it, you know, will the fans be pleased? If I write it this way, will, will the fans not be pleased? And so on and so forth. That I think can be very tricky, but eventually when it comes to an album production, you might take these expectations into consideration when it comes to arranging the cues. Yes and no. There's always, you know, I think, yeah, for me, the fan expectations is purely an indicator of, you know, hey, there's a lot of people who cherish this story. And so maybe you should spend a little bit of extra time investing yourself in this story as well. And that, so that's how I looked at it. When, when it came time to do the soundtrack, you know, soundtracks so often are a bit of a rush because you're, you're trying to finish the series and they're saying, oh, where's the soundtrack? You know, so inevitably, you know, you're going to forget to put something on the soundtrack that people love. Yes. I tried to make a soundtrack that was much bigger than what was actually released than what what we were able to release so i i wish i could release all the music you know because i am really proud of it but yeah people you know write to me on twitter all the time hey like where's this cue where's that cue and i'm sorry i just can't uh, you know like it's not uh, it's not it's out of my control <laughs> i'm doing yes. my best here and, and and of course you know you cannot please everybody and of course the music is designed to fit and match the visuals and of course if you have a great album to boot all the better you know and i think it is a really good album so and of course i would also love to hear more material um of of of, of what you wrote but i think we'll get to that at some point um down the road but joe do you feel this was one of your most complex and even am ambitious scores you have ever done to this point in retrospect, I, I guess it was while I was doing it. I mean, I was under no illusions. I was, I knew that this was going to be a big series in terms of expectations. You know, no one ever knows if something's going to be successful or not, but I knew this, the, the expectations were high. So I guess that's another reason why I poured a lot of energy into it. I also treated it, you know, I treated the series like four films, you know, and I think, I think, I think, some of the directors did too because the way they laid it out was every two episodes was a different director so one director directed the first two another director directed the next two so it kind of naturally felt like four films and so when i say we treated like that what i mean is just my entire team you know uh, like turnaround in tv is a lot more brutal than films so i just knew i had to have my whole team ready to hey we're going to have a lot of music coming through the pipeline. We're going to have to have, you know, we, we had two sets of orchestrators. We had, you know, engineer, an engineer in Budapest, an engineer here in LA, you know, we, we, and, and everyone got to know each other in the pipeline, you know, I had to make sure the pipeline would flow so that, you know, by the time we get to dubbing and mixing and all that, that, that I was able to still maintain my initial vision. And that, that's really yet another reason why I like starting early is because by the time you get, into the middle of things, you know, we're, uh, some of the most simple movies I've done that you might say, oh, Joe, that movie was really, you know, very straightforward score, very, you know, the music, only a few layer levels. Sometimes those are super complicated. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I guess this one, you could tell, this one, you could tell there's a lot of nuance in the score. There are a lot of layers happening. And so I knew that, you know, it was so important for me to go in. I think, I think it was about, we had about 45 to 50 minutes of suites. Mm -hmm. of, of of music and themes and so that you know when you get lost in the middle of it in the middle of scoring as you inevitably do because oh i you know i'm working with this arranger i'm working with this engineer i'm working with this sound designer i'm working with the orchestra and you're going to get asked a question and you're going to say oh what why did i want to do that again you could always you could always think back to that initial spark of inspiration that you had um uh so yes it definitely was one of the most complex but at the same time because the initial ideas were so uh loved and uh so much thought had been put into them yes. that i think we were able to navigate it uh perhaps even better than some some projects we've been a part of that might seem simpler <laughs> if that makes sense <laughs> yes it does joe thank you very much and you just mentioned the part where you have to create a vision and follow your instincts also. And that, is, that can be, I think, especially tricky when you have to deal with different 
directors because this show of course doesn't just have one director so you not only have to follow the story and enhance the journey of the characters and the groups of characters but you have to please multiple directors multiple directors multiple producers you know i try to do as you could tell i try to do a lot of homework and part of that homework is speaking to producers on an individual basis or at least as much of a one by one basis as you can so you can realize what's important to them so when i spoke with the author lee you know we spoke a lot about the russian influences of her story so i knew that having russian influence in the orchestral material especially the the love theme between mal and lena was going to be super important so i made sure that i very clearly acknowledged you know what she was hoping to to hear in the score similarly with eric our, our showrunner you know he and i spoke a lot about the crows and what what makes them tick what inspires them and especially because we have you know invented this new backstory for the crows the crows are, are actually a a, a a tangential series to the shadow and bone trilogy um, that happens after the main trilogy so we had to invent this backstory for six of crows or excuse me this this backstory for the crows so it's really important that we got their music right and so i actually read that second trilogy as well even though technically it wasn't part of shadow and bone um, but it it gave me a lot of homework to understand these characters and eric and i spoke about how their theme should never feel like it's too like we could know where it's going so it was we made sure that the theme it wasn't always in four four that it was in seven eight and five eight and kind of tripping over itself sometimes because the crows are operating and and trying to find their way to navigate through very complex situations similarly that's why there's like the ticking clock element but the way eric put it he said i always want the crows music to feel like it's going to fall off the rails you know like it's a train going down the track and it's going too fast it might everything might crash you know so that was really important to him and then um finally you know sean levy who was uh one of the executive producers and you know his company 21 laps was you know was producing this series you know but my conversations with sean were always about scale and scope and size of the music you know making sure that the music really stood up alongside these incredible visual effects and the scale of the story. So, you know, those are the clues I had. Those are the main clues. And of course I spoke to a lot, you know, a lot more people uh, than just those three producers, but just, but just, you know, piecing together a puzzle, what's important to them, but then also obviously combining it with, you know, my impression after reading the books, like what's important to me. So for instance, I knew that the Grisha had to have this very mystic otherness you know, because they were, you know, they, they, they're, they are human, but they possess these powers, Yes. but they're also ostracized because of it in a way that they're kind of set aside from everyone else. And everyone looks to them as this, both with, you know, with hope that maybe they could help save them from this war, but also with a bit of disdain. So for instance, I, I knew that the Grisha music had to have this sense of mystery and and otherness and power. And so that's why there's Gamelan, you know, it, completely unrelated to Russian <laughs> folk tales. <laughs> you know, there's this Javanese Gamelan in, in the Grisha music, but I think it works in, incredibly well for that. So that's a bit of a picture inside how my brain works when I'm, when I'm putting this together. Okay, great. And yes, I think collaboration can be very tricky, but also especially fruitful. And, you know, you know, you listen to the filmmakers' input and listen to what they have to say versus your own instincts and your own ideas. So that, I think, to find a common ground isn't always particularly easy. It is not. It is It is possibly the hardest thing about what I do is, is that, you know, there's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of, especially when you're working on a project like Shadow and Bone or on a film that costs a hundred million dollars, you know, like there are, there's a lot of money being spent. And so the people spending that money, um, uh, you know, have a certain set of expectations that you have to provide. But I think, I think the key is to always understand that you are there as an artist, you know, that is what you are being paid. You're being for paid for your artistic perspective. So while yes, you need to acknowledge the notes and acknowledge the suggestions from everyone else, they don't expect you to just do everything they say. They're expecting you to, to acknowledge the notes in an artistic way that you are going to find a creative solution 
to the problems that you are trying to solve, you know, and it's important yes. to understand, Hey, I'm, I'm here for a reason. I'm here for my creative, uh, understanding of this and my ideas. And, and so, so it, that's, what's expected of me that, that it's expected that I make this artistic contribution based on, based on the, the thoughts of, 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 uh, of the team. So that's how, at least how I like to think of it. And that's how I like to operate. Yes, and, and that's very interesting, and you're making a good point there, because they hire you for a reason, and you get the job for a reason, and you have your strong suit, let's say, for a day, and of course, if you can expand on that, and then deliver, that's the the best case scenario. Well, like you said about collaboration, what's so important about the collaborators I have is that they bring a different perspective to the table, and they might fill in those those weaknesses that I might have, you know, I think it's, that's why, you know, no film composer can truly be by themselves because, you know, the expectations and the budgets and the, uh, uh, just the expectations just are just so high that, you know, having a team with you, having uh, a, an idea, a plan and, and having people around you to help you execute it is just always going to be essential. And that, that is what movie making is, you know, and that's what makes it magical, I think, is that you are not alone, that you are part of a whole group of people from, you know, the stage hands to the executives, to the director, to the catering, you know, people, yeah. you're, all, you're all trying to make You're just trying to make something as good as it can be. And that, that to me, is, is part of the magic of what we do. A couple of minutes ago, you mentioned the, um, the time constraints. And if I remember correctly, you had 11 or 12 months to, to work on Shadow and Bone? About that. You know, we it was the first four or five months of the year or so that I spent you know, working on suites on and off. And then it wasn't until June and July or so that we really got working in earnest to picture. Um, and then, and then started, you know, delivering and recording. I believe we had our first recording session in August. Um, so by the time we got to, and then we were all delivered by November. So, you know, the bulk of the work was in, was over about three or four months, which so, in some ways it was a really luxurious process that I started so early so I could let these ideas grow. But once we started actually scoring to picture it, it went by very quickly. <laughs> it was, it was, it was really fast. So, so that was, that was exciting. It was, it was a very exciting and thrilling process. And I hope we get to make many more episodes of shadow and bone fingers right. crossed. Right. I, I'm sure season two, will be a success as well and maybe maybe we will get to see season two within the next you know seven or eight months depending on how fast they we'll can... see my goodness yeah i know i i don't know how any of this works i'll just i'll just wait by the phone and see what happens <laughs> okay, great um joe i know you have to run but may i ask you what's actually next for you what are you currently working on Yes, I'm running off to a session for my next film, Escape from Spiderhead, uh, which is uh, my fourth film now with Joseph Kaczynski, um, which I'm really excited about. Comes out uh, this fall. Miles Teller is back again. It's 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 wonderful that you know you develop these relationships. I've met Miles once. I don't think he'll remember me, but I think this is my fourth or fifth film with Miles Teller. You know, two in the Divergent series, and and now you know I did Only the Brave with Joe. Uh, a few years ago, which Miles was in, and now Miles is in this new film, and Chris Hemsworth and and Journey Smollett. It's it's incredible cast. The film's coming out great. The score is coming out great. I can't wait to share it with you guys later this year. Great, Joe. Is there anything else you would like to add? Anything else that comes to mind before we wrap up? Oh my goodness! I'm also really excited about. Um, you know, I got to work with Moby uh, last year. I've worked with Moby a few times now, and um, this. Uh, I got to do the arrangements and orchestrations for his new album reprise, which is a uh, revisit of all his classic hits, but completely reimagined with the uh, orchestra as well as with new, a new band, you know, Moby, Moby's an incredible multi-instrumentalist. I got to be a part of the recordings. I even played piano here and there. It was really a thrilling, uh, thrilling experience, but that comes out, I believe at the end of May and there's already a couple of singles available. So I just, I feel so lucky that I get to do all these cool things from, you know, working with Daft Punk to scoring Shadow and Bone to working with Moby. 
um, you know, uh, to working on psychological thrillers like Escape from Spiderhead. I'm, I think I'm potentially one of the luckiest people on the planet. So <laughs> Great. very excited. Great. I'm looking forward to the Moby album because I really enjoy his music too. So that oh, good. That's a, that's gonna be a highlight for me uh, for me as well. Joe, thank looking you very much. I had a blast talking to you. Thank you very much. Good. And stay Same. safe. Stay thank healthy. You. Have a good time. You too. Bye. You too. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye.